Greetings, I'm Jeevan Ambat, and in the 8 to 12 minutes we have, I want to discuss how astrogliosis correlates with remyelination in neurons, and I hope by the end you'll get an idea for how this concept really paves some exciting new roads and potential future areas of research in the neuroscience world. So I've laid out four prime goals for our time together. First, I want you to be able to understand what exactly demyelination and remyelination are, as well as what astrogliosis is as well. I want to make sure though you understand both of these ideas in terms of not only theory, but also how quantitatively they can be measured. Of course, as the title suggests, I will also demonstrate how astrogliosis and remyelination correlate to each other through pictures and data tables and graphs. Then I will cap this all off with trying to lay out what all this exactly means in the bigger picture of neuroscience. So let's start by setting where exactly we are focusing right now. Here we have a picture of a neuron and under normal conditions it would be able to conduct electrical impulses via its axon to other neurons. But wrapped around these axons are these components called myelin sheets. These myelin sheets, made of multiple layers of myelin, help the axon to conduct signals at a constant and quick rate and are crucial for the neuron to be able to function normally conducting signals. Now how are these sheets formed and able to be functioning themselves? In order to answer this I must introduce you to neuroglia. Neuroglia are specialized cells which help neurons and there are several different types of neuroglia which assist different components of a neuron but for our purposes we must now focus on the oligodendrocyte, as it is the neuroglia responsible for the formation of the myelin sheath. Specifically, it does this by pinching out its membrane in order to form the myelin sheaths around the axons. With this information, we can look at what demyelination is. Simply, it is when these myelin sheaths we've seen get damaged or even destroyed. This slows down electrical signals traveling down the axons of neurons slowing down a variety of processes such as sensation, movement, etc. And one particular cause of demyelination is a neurotoxin, specifically in this case, cuprazone. Now the exact mechanism by which cuprazone works here is relatively unknown, but for our focus we need to understand that cuprazone simply degrades oligodendrocytes and this in turn damages and in some cases destroys the myelin sheets. But of course, when demyelination occurs, our body responds to such an event by triggering remyelination. Now this is exactly what the name implies. The precursor cells to oligodendrocytes increase their ability to regenerate oligodendrocytes, which in turn regenerate previously damaged myelin sheets on the axon. It should be noted that these myelin sheets are slightly thinner than the original sheets, but are still just as functional. Now, it's nice to conceptually understand myelination, but in a scientific environment, how could scientists quantitatively measure demyelination or remyelination? It turns out that this is possible due to a protein called myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG for short. MOG is expressed when myelination occurs, and so with an increase in myelination, as we've seen in remyelination, there will be an increase in MOG expression. Now we should discuss astrogliosis. Remember when I had discussed neuroglia previously? Well now I'm introducing you to another type, astrocytes. For our purposes of study, astrocytes help provide nutrient support to the neuron, and so astrogliosis simply refers to when there is an abnormal increase in the number of astrocytes, which is a typical response to a decrease in neurons in the body due to neurotoxins and such. Like with myelination, we should ask, how can we quantitatively measure astrogliosis? This is through the expression of glial fibrillary acidic protein, or GFAP for short. The greater the number of astrocytes present, the greater the expression of the GFAP. Now that I've discussed demyelination, remyelination, and astrogliosis, the big question now is, how exactly do they correlate to one another? Well, to answer this, we turn to the scientific literature. So here, researchers have experimented on eight-week-old mice to observe the expression of MOG over acute and chronic demyelination induced by cuprazone. 
The two bars on the left represent the data for the control group, which ingested no cuprazone and thus had no demyelination. Over the duration of 14 weeks, there was a slight increase in the area of neural tissue over which MOG was expressed. However, it was not a statistically significant increase. But let's look now at the two middle bars representing eight-week-old mice who were fed cuprazone for six weeks and then removed from the cuprazone for six weeks. This is modeling acute demyelination. What's important here is not the percent area where MOG was expressed, but rather that there is a significant increase in the area where MOG was expressed. This increase is also present in mice who were fed cuprazone for 12 weeks and then removed from the cuprazone for another 12 weeks, which models chronic demyelination. But this increase is to a lesser extent. So what do the results from this graph mean exactly? Well, if cuprazone were fed to these mice, we would normally expect severe demyelination to occur and for MOG expression to go down. But this seems to happen initially. However, over the time frame, the neural tissue area where MOG is expressed increases. This strongly supports remyelination occurring during the time frame. Now, what about for astrogliosis? Well, in the same experiment, the researchers were able to quantitatively record GFAP expression in the same mice over the same acute and chronic demyelination modeling period. Here in this table, we see that GFAP expression increases as expected from the start point to before six weeks. However, at the six week point, the mice were fed cuprazone and from this point, the GFAP level drops significantly at first. But as the time frame progresses, the level of GFAP increases for both acute and chronic models. These levels return to normal once the mice are taken off cuprazone. The main takeaway from this graph is that GFAP levels also show an increase when demyelination is induced, showing strong evidence for astrogliosis occurring along with remyelination, which is discussed before. Additionally, we have here another graph showing the Pearson correlation, ranked on a scale of negative one to positive one, for GFAP and various other proteins expressed. For both the acute and chronic time courses, the mice were observed. A Pearson correlation of positive one was determined. This simply means that there was a strong positive relationship between the time and GFAP expressed, which again reinforces the support for astrogliosis occurring in the mice neuronal tissue. At this point, to attempt to bring our exploration to a close, I want to zoom our focus out a bit. For most of our time together, I've been talking theoretically and quantitatively about how astrogliosis and remyelination correlate to each other, but now I want to look at what to do with the information we found, where we can go from here. Seeing the correlation between astrogliosis and remyelination is significant in and of itself. However, from here, it would certainly be worthwhile to find out if there is a causational relationship between the two processes and what exactly is the driving factor behind all this. Scientists could attempt to inhibit or increase the expression of related proteins expressed during demyelination and remyelination and subsequently compare levels of MOG with GFAP to observe the effect this has on astrogliosis or vice versa. The opportunities for scientific exploration from this point are endless. But lastly, I find it very important to mention how our research correlation could help practically in a field such as medicine. A neurological disease such as multiple sclerosis is characterized specifically by the demyelination of neurons. Tons of research has been conducted showing remyelination that occurs under demyelination conditions. But yet, is there a way to control remyelination to increase it artificially in order to more quickly restore demyelinated neurons. If there is a relationship between remyelination and astrogliosis, for example, then perhaps astrogliosis could artificially be controlled and be increased in order to increase remyelination and thus speed up the rate at which demyelinated neurons are restored. This just swings open the door for more incredible opportunities for scientists to research and perhaps find a way to not only make breakthrough discoveries here, but also find a way to benefit neurological medicine. So 
In our time together, I hope to have not only given you an understanding of the correlation between astrogliosis and remyelination, but also what this correlation could potentially mean in the broader view of neuroscience as well as neurology. I hope to shed some light on a very small pinhole-sized area within the neuroscience realm.